So are we ready to start? I'm ready if you are. Yes, please. Okay. Go for it, Dipana. Great. So Maya, I'll just begin in Afamia and then we'll transition to English. Just All right. Um, yeah. Um, उपस्थितर <laughs> उत्तर पूर्वांचल मानुखात शांति शांति शिक्षा गवेषणा अति गुतपूर्ण कारण आम कारण संघात जीवंत इतिहास आम जीवन कलते देखी इन संघात संघटित हुआ गति के छ्र छ्रीय शांति ऊपर संघातर ऊपर पीस एंड कनफ्लिक्ट स्टाडिज रिसार्च कर अतिक जरूरी मैं भाव आज डर हलवर्डक आम पाएक आनंदित डर हलवर्डे जीतने बुझी ना पाए मैं परवर्ती अनुषान इंग्लिश इंगराजीते परचालित लाभ विचार सो आई उल विगेन ब इंट्रडिंग डर हलवर्ड टू अल अव यू Uh, she is. I'm. I'm very fortunate to have her as a co-worker at the School of Conflict Management, Peace and Development at the Kennesaw State University. She is a professor of Middle East politics and also the director of the PhD program, uh, the International Conflict Management Program, as we um, call it. So, if you are planning to uh, go for higher, um, you know, uh, research in peace and conflict studies, she's the person. So uh, she is um, also associate editor of the Journal of Political Science Education, and uh, she has served as the executive editor of the Journal of Peace Building and Development in the past. And uh, Dr. Halvard's PhD was uh, in international relations from the American University's School of International um, Service with a concentration in peace and conflict resolution um, and also in critical geopolitics. She has authored or co-authored seven books, uh, which include um, NGOs and Human Rights, Understanding International Conflict Management, and um, Struggling for a Just Peace, uh, Israeli and Palestinian Activism in the Second Intifada. Um, in 2002, she was Fulbright Scholar in Jordan, and she has led multiple study trips to, uh, middle, to the Middle East. So uh, we are very happy to have you here with us, Dr. Halvard. Um, over to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that very kind um, introduction. And I'm very happy to be with you today. Um, I don't know what the background in all, of all of you is in terms of how much background you have in some of this material. So I primed it for a general audience, and I'm happy to go more in depth in question and answer uh, with all of you. Uh, so I was asked to talk about the Nobel Peace Prize winner for 2023. Um, and so I wanted to just start with a little bit of uh, background information on the Nobel Peace Prize to put that in context. Um, so since the 1901, the Nobel Peace Prize has been awarded 104 times. And sometimes there have been co-winners. Uh, so there have been 138 people who have won the Nobel Peace Prize. Of these, 92 are men, 19 are women, and 27 have been organizations. I um, mean, so you can get a sense of the fact that only 19 women out of these 138 laureates is a very small uh, number. The Peace Prize was meant to be awarded to the person who has done the most or the best work for fraternity between nations, for the abolition or reduction of standing armies, and for the holding and promotion of peace congresses. And so the focus of the Peace Prize and who it's been awarded to has changed and evolved over the time as the international political situation has changed and the focus of what it means to work for peace has changed. Um, and since World War II, the Peace Prize has mainly been focused in areas of arms control and disarmament. So for example, uh, the Peace Prize was given to organizations working on uh, banning landmines at one point. 
um, in terms of peace negotiation, democracy and human rights, um, and also work aimed at creating a better organized and more peaceful world. Um, and so there have been uh, different areas in which uh, the Peace Prize has been awarded. I, I know President, uh, former President Barack Obama received one uh, for negotiation efforts. Uh, those involved in the Israeli-Palestinian, the signers of the um, Camp David or Egypt and Israel for the Camp David Agreement, um, along with Jimmy Carter. So there have been different times when negotiation at the high state level has been the focus, times in transnational advocacy organizations, such as the, ban the landmine organization. So there have been lots of different types of uh, Peace Prize uh, focus. And as I said before, only 19 women have won the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, over time. And the 19th which of which was Nargis Mohammadi, who was the 2023 uh, recipient. Um, and she is Iranian human rights activist, 51 years old. Um, and she was the deputy head of the Defenders of Human Rights. Um, and this was a center that was led by Shireen Abadi, who was actually another female Peace Prize laureate. Uh, she was the 2003 laureate. Um, and so she was an, this organization has ha been under attack a lot by the Iranian uh, regime um, because of its advocacy, its human rights advocacy. So Nargis Mohammadi falls under sort of that, that category of, of working for human rights. Uh, and particularly she has worked on protests for uh, gender rights, uh, for civil rights, for democracy. She has been a, in prison off and on uh, for the past 12 years. Her husband is also uh, an activist, Taghi Ramani, uh, and the two of them sort of rotated in and out of prison uh, during the time, and they've got two 16-year-old ch children, and the only time that they've really all been together as a family, all four of them, was when they were just toddlers. Uh, so the children have essentially grown up with parents alternating who's in jail, um, they're currently in exile in France. Um, and you can see here, we think of Iranian women as always covered and in black. Uh, that's the state requirement uh, for them, for women to be veiled um, when they're in public. Um, but a lot of women have protested this. Um, and there have been protests against the, the regime uh, that started really in August 22 when Masa uh, Amini was imprisoned and then killed. Uh, for not covering her hair adequately. Um, and so Nargis Mohammadi has been really at the forefront of some of the writing um, against uh, these policies. Um, and from prison even, she's organized protests, sit-ins, uh, written guest essays, organized workshops for female inmates about their rights. Uh, so she's been very active even from prison uh, regarding uh, the role of women's rights in Iran, as well as broader sort of civil society activism um, and work for democracy. Recently, she was transferred to sort of the Evin prison in uh, Tehran, apologies for that typo, um, and which is supposedly a much one of these harsher famous uh, prisons uh, in, in, in the country. Starting in December, she became, went on a hunger strike um, in solidarity with the Baha'i community. Uh, so the Baha'i community is a religious minority that has been under target in Iran and other parts of, of the world at various points in time. Um, but they've been under often on again threat by uh, the Iranian regime for their religious beliefs over the past uh, decades. I don't know exactly what the specific incident was um, that happened in December that led her to go on hunger strike, um, but that is something that is um, notable. Um, a number of global human rights uh, organizations have made claims and statements and, and put out publicity about concern for her health um, and for the health of other inmates in Iranian jails related to this and other concerns. Um, this photo is uh, her husband and her two children uh, at the Nobel Prize uh, room. This is sort of the Nobel Prize guest log. Um, and this is where they are there to uh, receive the award on her behalf since she was in prison. She hasn't seen her children in eight years. 
most recently uh, was the re most recent time she saw them and her children when they were interviewed um, in conjunction with this Nobel Prize award they were very pessimistic that they would see her again um, but the children spoke about what an inspiration she was and how her ideals and her values and the struggle she's done has been uh, sort of a, an inspiration to them and they feel like she's with them even though she has not physically been able to be with them for the past eight years. So I wanted to talk a little bit about, in the context of peace and the Nobel Peace Prize, um, some of the different ideas of peace that we talk about in the field of conflict management, um, peace building and development. And I think most people are very familiar and uh, aware of this idea of negative peace which is the absence of war and violence, right? And this is what we tend to think about when we think about peace is the absence of war. And we even saw that category uh, in the Nobel Peace Prize of people working for negotiations and diplomacy. And a lot of times the, the goal of diplomacy and negotiations is to end a war or to sign a peace agreement. But what does that really mean? Typically in common everyday parlance, we think about it just meaning as the war has ended. But what happens after a war has ended, right? Sometimes we talk about also a war and peace and a cold peace. And a cold peace means the violence has ended um, and they have not gone back to war. So often the, the relations between Egypt and Israel is seen as a cold peace. Egypt and Israel have not gone back to war again since the signing of the Camp David Agreement in 1979. But they definitely do not have a warm peace. You don't see Egyptians and Israelis uh, traveling to each other's countries regularly. You don't see them having warm relationships and common endeavors. The main common endeavor that Egypt and Israel have been engaged in most recently is together upholding the blockade on Gaza. Um, and that's a, between governments and also more of an issue uh, in, in sort of the security realm and not an area of warmth uh, between civil society. In contrast, when we talk about positive peace, uh, this is sort of an idea put, to, put forth by Johan Galtung, in, uh, who's a peace scholar in Norway, um, and also Martin Luther King Jr., who was um, a civil rights activist and preacher in the Southern USA. Um, and this idea is that you have the attitudes, the institutions, the structures that create and sustain peaceful societies that help enable people to reach their full potential, um, and help make or for a resilient society so that when there are acts that could potentially lead to violence in some cases, the society has enough uh, resilience and capacity to not revolve into or devolve into war and armed violence, but rather can um, maintain peaceable relations or at least uh, resist falling into a violent conflict. So some aspects in this particular diagram, some of the aspects of peace, positive peace are identified as a well-functioning government, equitable distribution of resources, free flows of information, good relations with neighbors, high levels of human capital, acceptance of the rights of others, low levels of corruption and a sound business environment. So this is just one uh, portrayal of positive peace. Uh, sometimes we also see people talk about um, high support for civil rights and human rights, um, high levels of education, this idea of equitable distribution of resources. Um, it's important to differentiate this idea of equity, which means everybody has what they need in order to succeed versus equality, uh, which means everybody has the same, right? So this idea of equality, when you have a diverse population, not everybody is in the place to need the same thing. So equity, um, is the idea that you make sure that people have uh, what they need according to the, the place where they're starting from. Uh, so sometimes there's an image of, of two children, one who's quite tall, one who's quite short, trying to look over a fence at a baseball game. Equality is them just both being there on the ground with the same fence in front of them. And equity is when the smaller child has a box to stand on so that both of them can look over the fence. Um, that's one sort of visual representation of equity. Um, so this is sort of this idea of, of positive peace. Um, and in the case of Iran and Nargis Mohammadi, you can see that she's they're struggling against sometimes uh, corruption, the lack of acceptance of rights, 
um, not always free flow of information, um, definitely not good relations with neighbors. Iran has uh, a number of struggles with uh, neighboring countries and is involved in a number of proxy wars in the region as well. Um, so there are a number of challenges facing um, human rights activists and others in civil society within Iran. The other thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is another way of looking at this Nobel Peace Prize winner is through the lens of the Sustainable Development Goals. And the Sustainable Development Goals were passed by the United Nations as part of the 2030 Agenda. Um, and they follow up on, on what were previously called the Millennium Development Goals, which were aimed at the 2000s. And we're now in 2023, so we're past the Millennium Development Goals. Most of them were not met. Um, and this is this idea to try to address thematic issues that face countries around the world, particularly those identified as developing countries um, on topics including water, energy, climate, um, a whole range of, there were 16 or 17, uh, develop, 17 development goals. And two of them in particular are of relevance to talking about this Nobel Peace Prize uh, winner. One is the sustainable development goal number five, uh, which is gender equality. Um, and the goal is to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. And you can see from this graphic that the world is not on track to achieve gender equality by 2030. Um, only the small amount, I think it's like 15% um, of countries are on track out of the indicators. Um, and you can see all the rest are not on track. Some are very far off track and some are at a moderate distance, but it's not very clear uh, where that line is. It looks like about 60% are at a moderate distance and 23% are very far. Um, and, it, and it's quite difficult to sort of see these data sort of at the current rate, it will take 300 years to end child marriage 286 years to close gaps in legal protections, and 140 years to achieve equal representation in leadership in the workplace. Um, and, and so part of the work of Nargis Mohammadi is actually related to this goal five of achieving gender equality and empowering women and girls. Um, the 2022 uprising in Iran was focused on women, life, and freedom. Uh, women in Iran uh, have very different different access to employment, education, social benefits, and health care than men. Um, and women really, in order to receive a lot of those benefits and those basic rights, uh, depend on complying with these hijab laws. So these laws that you wear the hijab in public, um, and there are groups that then monitor women's compliance with this, how much of their hair is covering, if their hair is covered, what they're wearing out and about in public. Um, so women have been struggling to end some of these laws and to achieve greater equality of women in the workplace and in the government, um, as well as different rights that govern women's marriage age and inheritance, as well as guardianship rights. So having a guardian that helps oversee and controls what women can and cannot do. 2006, for example, there was a 1 million signature campaign that was trying to end some of these unequal laws. Um, that was not successful. Um, and there have been more efforts once with social media, Facebook, Twitter, other things, the internet has given women more space for protesting more broadly because they can do so from their homes and they can reach broader audiences. The government does have a lot of controls on, on the internet and other things, but often these activists are very creative at finding ways around that. Um, but women continue to be able to be fined and imprisoned for not wearing the hijab according to government regulations um, in public spaces. And there continue to be inequalities um, in access uh, to inheritance, marriage age, et cetera. Uh, and it's not unique to Iran. Again, one in five young women around the world uh, in these areas are married before their 18th birthday. So there continues to be uh, young marriage um, in other places and unequal representation in politics uh, around the globe as well. And so these are some of the things that Nargis Mohammadi is struggling against uh, and led to her imprisonment, but also to her awarding uh, 
the Nobel Prize. The other sustainable development goal that's uh, related to this, this case would be Sustainable Development Goal 16, which is to promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, provide access to justice for all, and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. Um, and so this is related to the work of Nargis Mohammadi on working for rights, helping youth, women, and others be represented in politics. Uh, right now, this, this graphic down here at the bottom shows that youth are, the global median age is 30, uh, but the average age of members in parliament is 51, so about 20 year gap. In Iran in 2020, the median age in Iran was 32. I wasn't able to find uh, data for the average age uh, in the Iranian government, but um, the Iranian system is a very mixed system. So some are elected, but some are appointed by uh, religious leadership. And the religious leadership is able to, some of these appointed positions by um, religious leadership are able to strike candidates and determine who is eligible to uh, run for election. So there, even in those uh, elected areas, there's a lot of restriction. Uh, women are more than 60% in the university system in Iran, um, but are not equally represented in government or in uh, the workplace and have a lot of restrictions on them as we were just discussing. In the response to the 22, 2022 protests over gender rights, um, democracy, et cetera, over 500 Iranians were killed. The number might be higher than that, but that is sort of the official number that, that has been put forth. Um, and, and so that connects to some of these conflict-related civilian deaths. Now is internal conflict and protest related, um, but Iran is also involved in a number of proxy wars in Yemen, in Syria, uh, and there have been tens of thousands of civilian deaths um, in these two conflicts that Iran is party to. Now, other countries are also party to those. It's not Iran alone, um, but this is just a, a, another piece of, of, of the puzzle. Um, so part of Nargis Mohammadi's activist work has been on women's rights, also on democracy, civil society, um, et cetera, both particularly related to internal conflicts, but some of these internal dimensions have overflow effects in terms of uh, external conflicts as well. So finally, I just wanted to note that as um, Udipana mentioned at the beginning, I am part of with her, part of the School of Conflict Management, Peace Building and Development at Kennesaw State University. Um, and we have a PhD in International Conflict Management that's interdisciplinary, um, that looks at uh, a wide range of sources of, of conflict, as well as ways to address conflict from an interdisciplinary lens. Uh, we also have a Master's of Conflict Management, which is aimed more at mid-career professionals and is much more practical and applied skills-based. Um, with sort of mostly weekend classes for people who work full time but want to get more practical skills related to conflict management. And we also have a center of conflict management that carries out trainings, that does organizes mediation, um, and does a lot of service to the community, both on campus and off campus. Um, and I have links here to both of these uh, programs for, for more information. And I'm happy to talk with you about any questions you have there and um, share information with you regarding um, if you're interested in, in applying to either of these programs or learning more about them. We actually have regular virtual open houses for both programs. Um, I know the next one for the PhD program is later in February, um, and the master's program has one several times um, a year as well. So next, I will just open up the floor to questions to see if any of you have any questions that you would like to ask. And happy to further the conversation at this point. Maya, thank you so much for that talk. And I'm sure um, our students were hugely benefited from this. And especially, as I said in the beginning, um, you know, uh, studying peace and conflict is very important. It's essential for us in Northeast India and in Assam because we've had a lived experience of it. 
So I'm hoping that your talk has inspired uh, some of the students present here today to uh, pursue it. And as you said, um, you know, we have these amazing programs and um, amazing opportunities for um, young researchers, uh, students who want to pursue their masters, uh, professionals even. So um, the, as Maya said, the floor is open. Uh, if any of you want to ask any questions, uh, you can uh, type them in the chat or um, you can raise your hand here. Uh, Udipana, I saw someone was raising hand, but uh, I see the hand down now. If anyone wants to, okay. Um, whoever it was who had raised their hand, could you uh, please speak up? Sorry, we missed you uh, when you did raise your hand. I think I saw one question on YouTube that uh, uh, someone wanted to know uh, that uh, about the current Nobel laureate that uh, was she acting alone as her, as an activist or she is part of an organization and can you throw some light on it? Yeah, so she was part of an organization that was started by Shireen Abadi, who was a former Nobel Prize laureate in Iran, also on women's rights issues. She's a, a writer and activist. Um, and so she was acting as part of that organization and also on her own. She's been involved in a lot of activist uh, activities over the past 30 some years. Um, but she was nominated uh, in part specifically as her in her role for this these most recent protests, as well as her work on women's rights more broadly in human rights. There was another question I saw on Facebook about uh, opportunities for students who wish to pursue studies uh, abroad like or maybe opportunities uh, in the US or elsewhere about uh, you know I mean peace related or conflict management studies yeah so we have we RP I can speak to our program I don't um I can't speak to all programs but our program typically has two admission cycles we have an admission cycle um in February that for students to start in August and we have an application deadline in August for people to start in January uh, we typically have about half of our students are typically international students and about half of the students are U.S. citizens. We have um, some scholarships. We have some funded lines for, for students. Some students find their own funding through other positions on campus um, or there are also opportunities. I know the U.S. Government, for example, has the Fulbright Award. Students can apply for Fulbright for studies in the U.S. Um, and there are other 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 scholarships. I know um, sometimes other organizations have. Um, there are other institutions for conflict management in the in the U.S. A couple that I know of are Nova Southeastern, and I think they've got some online courses too. So that might even be something people can do from anywhere in the world. Um, the Croc School uh, at Notre Dame in, in Indiana has um, a PhD program. Uh, George Mason in Virginia has a PhD program in conflict analysis. And there's a lot of master's programs all over uh, uh, the country as well. There are a couple databases that I, I think the Peace and Justice Studies Association maintains a database that has a listing of all of those programs. Um, so that might be one place to look if that's something you're interested in looking at. Of course, there's also programs in the UK. Um, University of Bradford, for example, has some, a number of different uh, institutions in Europe, um, the Geneva Institute um, and elsewhere, but I know the US programs um, best. Um, yeah, just to add to that, I think there are quite a few institutes in uh, Europe which uh, study uh, peace and conflict. Um, uh, but the focus would be a little different and specifically speaking in terms of um, not uh, focusing on the conflicts in Northeast, because I'm sure that's something that will be um, uppermost in the students' minds. Um, there, there is a lot of study being done in Europe on Northeast India. However, um, it hasn't really picked up in the US. 
But um, if you all come here, then, you know, <laughs> that can change, right? We can all study um, yeah, newer um, conflict zones. Um, so there was one question in the chat earlier about the, um, from students of the Gualpara College who wanted to know about the status of women in India. So maybe you want to just kind of put that in perspective of the status of women everywhere. <laughs> Uh, no, so, yeah. so, just to correct, she is professor in uh, Dudhnari College at uh, Dipanjali. And maybe, do you want to ask yourself, Dipanjali? Uh, I can unmute you. Yeah, please. Maybe you can ask in detail what you want to share. You're unmuted. You know, I think uh, you can uh, go ahead with the answer, sorry. Okay, uh, so I'm not as familiar with uh, all of the different instances of women in, in India, and India is such a very diverse country that I would hesitate to speak on uh, on all of that. But, but I will say that I think generally speaking, women face a, a wide range of challenges around the world um, that are unique to women. Um, one of those is women are often expected to carry out second shift duties um, in terms of uh, obligations and work um, in the house and in the community, um, emotional labor work that is very different than, than what men are expected. So even if women and men both have, let's say, even if they had equal opportunities outside of the house in the employment field, which I think is rare anywhere in the world, um, they women have more expectations at home. And that puts more burdens on them, um, both uh, emotional and in terms of energy and other resources um, that then makes it more difficult for them to advance equally in, in the workplace. I think there's also different assumptions related to how women are going to be in the work, uh, workforce. And again, this changes, this varies on cultural levels. It, it, it varies uh, again, again, on type of job, et cetera. But women are also often, um, penalized for not smiling. They often have comments on what they wear, um, have comments on a lot of things that would not be uh, questions or issues that would be raised towards men. Um, so, um, and we see this even at the presidential level, like when Hillary Clinton ran for president uh, several years back in the United States, um, the media was always focused on what she was wearing, whether she smiled, if she smiled too much, if she didn't smile enough, all of these things that presidential candidates who are male are not usually um, judged about. Um, and in the workplace, women often have more um, emotional labor, more community service are expected to respond quicker to emails, are expected to have different types of um, issues than, than, than men. And then of course, if you have a, a child, if you have childcare duties, if your child is sick, those tends to things fall on women um, and then make it harder for women to engage in some of those other things, those extracurricular things at work uh, that can lead to advancement, um, et cetera. So I don't know if that answers your question or not, but I think at a very basic level, even all things else considered equal to women, if they have equal access to work, which not all legal systems allow them to, um, there's still all of these other sort of unwritten, hidden types of challenges that they face. And it's not just, you know, in India or in the Middle East, it's everywhere, right? It, whether yes. it's the so-called developed world or the third world. Yeah, I was speaking from my experience in the US specifically. So I was <laughs> so um yeah. So I would I would say absolutely the and the challenges for for women everywhere are 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 there many unseen and I've had conversations with um, men who are like, oh, there's no women, there's women have a full equality. There's no issues facing women in the workplace. And I'm like, yeah, that's not actually <laughs> so accurate based on my own personal experience, but that's fine. Um, you you don't always see the, a lot of the things that are that that face women. Some are very obvious, right? So if you look at, at the case of Narjus Mohammadi and she's talking about this, these discrimination against women in terms of wearing the hijab in public, that's a very obvious visible form of discrimination. But there's many invisible signs of discrimination and, and things that hold uh, women uh, in that put up obstacles for women that are not as easily visibly documented around the world. Thank you, Maya. 
Um, Dr. Nath has a question about the career trajectory that students can um, adopt after studying uh, peace and conflict. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so again, from our program, we have some students who go on to be professors and academics. Again, that's the nature of a PhD program. Um, but we also have students who then go and work as monitoring evaluation specialists for international NGOs. We've had people work for the UN. Uh, we've had people who have uh, gone into research um, at companies such as Cisco to do be research analysts. We've had people work in various uh, government agencies. Um, at the master's level, we've had students go on to be ombuds and organizations uh, to work in um, the Red Cross and some of their emergency relief uh, institutes. So there's a lot of different ways uh, that people use this uh, degree, both in the in the, in government, so in the public sector, in the private sector, um, in academia, in NGOs. Mm -hmm. So there is an applied aspect to peace and conflict studies uh, as well, as maybe slightly more than in other fields. Absolutely. And our program in particular, so programs vary. So the master's program is much more applied um, in the PhD program, ours is pretty unique in that we look at applied work as well as theoretical work. Some PhDs in conflict analysis are more theoretically uh, and analytically inclined, and ours really tries to mix both the theory and practice. Thank you, Maya. Um, Gitanjali Devi has asked about the impact of Nargis's movement on the women of Middle East, uh, Middle Eastern countries. And uh, she says, thanks for your lecture. It was immensely beneficial for us. Oh, good, wonderful. So um, I think I'm gonna break that question apart into a couple pieces. One is that I think anytime you have uh, a woman, okay, and remember at the beginning, there've only been 19 women who have been Nobel laureates out of 138 Nobel laureates. So giving the recognition, the international recognition to a woman raises the level of international awareness uh, of the issue, right? And so that gives visibility to women in Iran in a way that they may not have had uh, previously, um, or maybe it had fallen back under the radar. So that gives a level of international legitimacy to their struggle and, and the work that they're doing. However, given some of the challenges in the international community and in the international system more broadly, um, for example, the U.S. in recent years has had very antagonistic relationships with Iran. Um, it's not clear whether the Nobel Prize, this is a debate we see in peace and conflict studies, is that whether international attention to an issue and to international activists gives them more legitimacy or makes them more of a target by their government, right? So it could be that the government of Iran then says, okay, the international community is ganging up on us. Um, and that can then sometimes cause more tension, or they can see that the claim that these activists are traitors and connected to the West or connected to our enemies. I mean, this is further evidence that they're not actually um, invested in Iran, right? So that I'm just speaking hypothetically right there, but that is something. So for example, in 2007, when there were the green movement protests um, in terms of a lot of Iranians took to the streets in protest of, of corruption related to the election. And President, then President Barack Obama very carefully, or 2009, 2007 or 2009, maybe it was, very carefully and very intentionally did not openly support the activists because of concerns that that could then undermine them um, and the work that they were doing. So this is a debate that happens um, in, in terms of transnational activism and how you best support um, indigenous local human rights activists and other activists um, from externally and whether external support um, empowers them or whether it undermines them. Um, but I think any time that a, a female activist is recognized for the work that she's doing, um, that does sort of empower and, and sort of uh, on a on a some level women uh, for being having their struggles recognized um, and acknowledged. I do want to say the second part of that question that I wanted to address is that. The Middle East is a huge region and each country is so different um, and diverse. And, and Iran uh, has a, a distinct culture, distinct uh, history, trajectory, civilizational identity than some of the other countries in the Middle East, both because of its Persian heritage, its Shia heritage. It's only 51% of Iran is sort of 
Persian, um, identify. Uh, so there's lots of mix of, of people in Iran and Iran has some very mixed relations with its neighbors, with Iraq, with Saudi Arabia, with Syria, all of these countries don't necessarily have the best relationships on a government level. The people, it can be different. Um, but the struggles facing women in different countries of the, of the Middle East vary, right? It depends on whether the country is has more of a religious government, more of a secular government, uh, what the different policies are, what the different struggles that they face are. So Iran and Saudi Arabia are relatively unique in terms of uh, requiring people, requiring women to wear the hijab um, in public. Um, most of the rest of the countries in the Middle East don't necessarily have that struggle. Um, there are struggles facing women in most countries in the Middle East, just as there are struggles facing women most places in the world, as we were just discussing. Um, so, I, so I think it depends on different levels, um, the extent to which her recognition for what she has done in Iran necessarily translates to other women's struggles elsewhere, right? I think on a broader conceptual level, the recognition of a woman Nobel laureate sort of uh, supports, is seen as supportive of women's struggles around the world, but it's also whether it empowers or disempowers specific women's struggles is a, is a separate question. Thank you, Maya. That puts it perfectly in perspective, I think. Um, there's another question from Gualpara College, and uh, they're asking if you have any opinion regarding the women of Myanmar. So um, before <laughs> we jump into it, I must remind you that you know in the Northeast, we uh, border Myanmar, right? So anything, any political upheaval, any, um, any disturbance that happens across the border also affects um, us, right, in Northeast India. So this is where I guess this question comes from. Excellent. So that's a really great question. I will say again, I'm not an expert in Myanmar. Um, I will say I think some of the challenges that women face in Myanmar. Um, again, um, I, I'm editing a one of the current projects I'm working on is um, a handbook of peace and conflict studies that is going to be published by Sage. Um, and I'm in charge of the section on case studies, and there's a case study that has been written um, on Myanmar and on um, some of the, the struggles in, in Myanmar. Uh, so I have been looking at different drafts of, of that, um, and I have followed to some extent some of the civil uprisings that have happened there, as well as the, the challenges facing um, sort of the stateless people um, in Myanmar as, as well. Now, the paper that I'm focusing on hasn't been as specific on gender um, and, and women, but, but I think there are a number of challenges in Myanmar regarding, again, uh, when you have an oppressive state, um, when you have challenges between different um, national identity groups in a state, when you have um, stateless people, when you have a history of repression um, and civil unrest. Um, women tend to bear the brunt of some of these issues. And a lot of times when there's a national struggle and also a gender struggle, women's movements historically, if you look across the board over time and across different country settings, women are asked to put their movement on hold while the national struggle is conducted. And so women are said, okay, we see your struggle, but the national struggle is more important or our ethnic struggle is more important, or the liberation struggle is more important. And once we complete that, then we will deal with the women's struggle. Um, and so um, without speaking, knowing the specifics of, of, of what's happening in Myanmar on that angle, I can say that this tends to be uh, the dynamic that happens um, in many countries around the world. Um, in terms of, yes, we see the women's struggle, but we need to look at this one first. Um, and then after that struggle, there's always another struggle. And so the women's struggle often gets put to the side, even when women have been uh, leaders in, in the movements. I was actually uh, helping my daughter study for a test she has coming up on World War II in the United States. And one of the questions had to do with question about women working in factories during World War II and what happened when the soldiers came home. And so women put things to the side. Women worked in the factories. There was lots of champion of women's rights and the Rosie the Riveter, we can do it type slogans. And then once the men come back, women are expected to silently and go back to working in the house without payment, without expectation of 
working in the home, right? Uh, outside of the home. Um, and, and so you see this uh, happen again and again. Um, so yeah, that's sort of my answer there um, without knowing more specifics. Yeah, I mean, it just replicates itself over and over again, right? So women are expected to have a public face, but then they cannot, these are men's struggles. The nationalist struggles are men's struggles. And then the women uh, have to step in whenever they're required and step back whenever, you know, uh, like actual decision-making happens. And that's been our experience in the conflict zone as well. So yeah, thank you for that. Um, are there any more questions, Rifat? There aren't any. Uh, yeah, there was one place. question online I saw on Facebook that, um, I mean, which probably is a little um, difficult, but still I will read it. That um, in your mind, because today this is, law talk is on Nobel Peace Prize, do you think that uh, there has been few very notable uh, peace activists in the past from all over the world who did not uh, receive the Nobel Prize. We will leave Mahatma Gandhi for the time being, but apart from him, anybody else in your mind that probably who would have got, who did not get it? I mean. Uh, so this is a really good question. And and I think um, it's, a, it's a challenging one because I don't know all of the histories of all of the people in, who've worked for peace around the world. But I think part of the issue is that only people who have won Nobel Prizes and certain other people can nominate. Uh, there's certain there's a nomination process, right? Um, and so part of it has to do with uh, who is seen on the global stage and whose names then get into the pot for being selected. Um, and as with any prize, again, there's going to be a an aspect of a political decision, right, in terms of part of the goal of the Nobel Prize is to raise attention to certain causes, to certain individuals. Um, and so we can see the change over time. I sort of noted that before World War II, it was mostly sort of diplomatic and very high level peace negotiation type things that were uh, the focus of the Nobel Prize. And then after World War II, there has been uh, this broader focus. Um, so I think part of it has to do with what kind of message the Nobel Peace Prize Committee is trying to send to the world, what kind of identity, uh, what kind of issues they're trying to raise awareness around. Um, and there's so many different uh, possible possible people and organizations and institutions that they could give them to. I'm sure there are many people who should get it that that do not um, because they can only give one a year and there's um, almost 200 countries in the world and so many different movements in all of them. So um, there's certainly people who deserve it who don't get it. But part of it, I think, is a, a matter of how they define peace and what their goals are in terms of those specific aspects of peace. And that's why I kind of tried to emphasize this difference between negative peace and positive peace um, and how uh, people in different parts of the world and different movements, what they might be seeking for in terms of some of the positive peace aspects might be seen as threatening to the status quo and might be then seen as contributing to conflict uh, rather than contributing to peace. Um, and this is one of the things in the field of peace and conflict studies that I talk about a lot in my classes is that there's a difference between conflict and violence. And conflict sometimes is very productive um, and can help lead towards peace if you're looking at positive peace. Because sometimes human rights issues, um, oppression, uh, different types of discrimination, some of those create latent conflict that we don't see in the public eye, um, but can be types of structural violence and cultural violence. Um, and so sometimes it takes conflict, protest, uh, nonviolent demonstrations, sit-ins, um, different types of activism to raise awareness about this latent conflict, about this oppression or discrimination. And that can be seen as conflict, even if it's not violent, right? And so sometimes uh, how those in power or who are making decisions just determine what is seen as work for peace um, is, is shaped then by someone's perspective and someone's position in the hierarchy um, and positionality of power, right? And so all of these different factors, I think, play a role in terms of determining what is seen as uh, work for peace, um, as well as what are, are worthy causes or individuals that you want to highlight as role models for people around the world uh, to emulate.
Oh, Dipana, do you have any comment on that? <laughs> yeah, actually, I mean, I'm I'm with you on this, Maya. And uh, just like we, I think, need to question um, the omission of certain people from the list of, uh, you know, Peace Nobel laureates, we could also question the inclusion of some of them, right? So it's, uh, again, a question of power, who's seen, who's not seen, what kind of conflicts are in the international conversations. Um, so there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, politics involved in that as well, right? So we can question and we can look at it from many different ways and, you know, talk about why did this person get the Peace Prize when, you know, uh, immediately after that they turned around and created all these many violent uh, and committed all these many violent uh, uh, acts of violence. So, um, yeah, we can go on and on with that. Uh, but I did see a hand uh, from Mohidul Islam. Yeah, um, are you there? Um, let us see. Mm -hmm. I don't see him anymore inside the, uh, the Zoom. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think some people are getting like um, yeah. you know, disconnected Maybe and then they're... Out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so hopefully he'll be able to right. come back. In the meantime, there's a question uh, from Mitra who says, um, who asks, to what extent are gender studies in Iran and also in the United States data driven? So maybe Mitra, like, is it Sangha Mitra? So maybe you can ask yourself. Uh, you are unmuted. Yeah, so should I answer the question or should I wait for someone to ask another one? Oh, go um, for it. It's okay. Well, I would say most, I would say most graduate studies programs and probably undergraduate studies too are data driven, right? Um, but it determines, uh, it depends on what you are considering to be data. I have this discussion with my students a lot um, that uh, empirical, uh, an empirical study does not need to be quantitative. Empirical means it's based on some kind of facts, some kind of uh, data and data can be determined in many different ways. We have qualitative data, we have quantitative data. Um, there are inductive and deductive approaches. Uh, there's grounded theory. There's so many different ways that uh, data can be constructed and developed and collected. Um, and so I would say any academic enterprise is going to be data driven, uh, but the type of data that drives that study is going, uh, going to vary depending on the, on the program. I think gender studies tends to be uh, often use uh, more feminist methodologies, use a lot more uh, types of methodologies that may not be understood as well um, in the sort of STEM fields, for example, um, because it's, it's, it's looking at questioning power, questioning relationships, looking at the voices of those whose voices are often not heard um, and sees data and sees stories and sees uh, conceptualize what is empirical in a very different way than what you might do in a chemistry lab, right? And so um, I would say that most academic fields are data-driven, but how they understand data and what terms they may use um, are going to differ depending on the field um, and the epistemology and ontological choices of that field. So what counts as knowledge, how that knowledge is collected and found. Um, so. That's my brief answer there. Yeah, this is a conversation I've been having constantly in my research methodology class. <laughs> Thank you, Maya. Um, I see that Mohidul Islam has joined back. Uh, do you want to ask your question, Mohidul? Maybe we will have to unmute him from our side one second. Oh, okay. Mm, oh, yeah, uh, Mohidul, yeah, uh, you, can, you can speak up, I guess. You are unmuted, please. Yeah, please, we, we can, uh, you are unmuted. Okay. Uh, 
So then, the, moving on, Udipana, I, I saw just, uh, I think this is a curiosity from my mind, which might be very silly, that uh, regarding the current Nobel laureate, um, is she still in prison? To my understanding, yes, she's still in prison. So, like, how does this, uh, uh, so that, that would be my, or like, you know, curiosity that how, uh this peace price being offered is leading or like you know leading to her acquittal does it have any role or not at all i mean i i personally don't think it would have any role in an acquittal process because she's in prison i think for a 12 or 13 year term this time around um and again like i mentioned before sometimes um international support for domestic activists doesn't sometimes that makes uh governments more entrenched in their positions um, because they might see it as an attack on their sovereignty, attack on some of their different policies. And so I don't see the Nobel Prize award for her really making any change in the current Iranian regime's stance to her um, at, at, at present, especially given the very negative. I mean, I think it would be different if the U.S. had some constructive relationships with Iran or diplomatic channels that were open. But I feel like the last stretch, the the U.S. has been very antagonistic towards um, Iran in many ways, uh, with the canceling of the JCPOA and, and other things. And so I don't know that the social capital and some of those connections exist really to leverage the Nobel Prize into any kind of change in Iranian policies um, at the moment. And, and I, I think if anything, and again, I'm I'm speaking on my own sort of speculation here, this is not sort of based in any kind of in-depth research I've done on this topic, but I would think based on the current situation in terms of where Iran is vis-a-vis -vis the international community, that it would not likely um, make any changes to this, because I think it feels more under attack um, than anything else vis-a-vis -vis the international community at this point, um, and would be seen as a sign of weakness to change its internal policies based on an external uh, organizational decision, particularly from a Western-based um, organization. Thank you so much. I think like I just this is just a thought. Maybe like what I can remember is that uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, right? I mean, from Burma, who was probably awarded Nobel Peace Prize at some point, right? And when she was in prison, maybe, and she went on to become the like her president, I guess, of the country, isn't it? So maybe there is uh, there is hope. I mean, that, that it could be, but I think her, I think if we look at the example of Aung San Suu Kyi, she has made some questionable, uh, questionable actions that are not consistent with the behavior you would expect of a Nobel Peace Prize laureate once she was in power, right? So I think uh, to Udipana's comment earlier, uh, that just because someone has uh, been awarded a Nobel Peace Prize does not make them a perfect human being. Um, or make them always make actions that are consistent with um, world peace or positive peace. I mean, I think there are no a number of examples I can think of offhand of individuals who won the Nobel Prize who have been involved in all sorts of egregious actions uh, that have been contrary to peace. Um, so I, I, I think, again, it can be partly a political decision. I think it can have an impact. It can empower people. So, for example, um, it uh, was awarded to Tawako Karman and Rose, uh, ro raised awareness about the struggles she was having in Yemen. Uh, there were some activists, um, I'm not going to pronounce their names correctly, um, from Ghana and elsewhere in, in Western Africa, and it helped raise awareness to their campaigns and their issues that they were struggling against. But again, it, it, it is not... Um, it's not a free pass to ena enacting change. It can be one mechanism that can help um, give legitimacy to certain audiences um, for the struggle that they're engaged in, but it can also be a sign of illegitimacy to other entities who may be uh, working against them, right? So it depends a little bit on the on the perspective and, and where people are. Um, in their stance vis-a-vis -vis these uh, international organizations. Thank you, thank you so much. And ultimately, I guess we must remember that the Nobel 
crises are also a lot about international power politics, right? Who controls um, the decision-making power and who decides? So these are questions that can go on and on. And you know, if you look at individual instances, like Suchi's government was finally toppled, right? Uh, so yeah, many questions. I think those are all the questions that I could find on all the platforms like uh, on Zoom, on Facebook and on YouTube. So any more questions? Maybe like, are there any questions from our group members here? Anyone? If not, uh, Udipana, before you conclude, uh, I will leave it to you. I want to um, say special thanks to the students uh, in two colleges who joined uh, in good numbers. One is the Dunnoy College, uh, and sincere thanks to their uh, very encouraging teacher, uh, Professor Dipanjali Devi. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Devi, and thanks to all the students, and also the students from Gualpara College. So again, like uh, sincere thanks to the principal of Gualpara College for uh, encouraging the students, and of course, thanks to the students from both the colleges who joined in good numbers. We really appreciate it. And now, Udipana, please, uh, you can uh, conclude maybe. Thanks, Rifat. And I echo your thanks to uh, these two colleges and to all the other students who have uh, joined today. Um, I am so happy as somebody from the Northeast who is working on peace and conflict. I'm very happy to see so much interest among the students and uh, the questions that you asked uh, reflected those um, that interest. So if you want to know um, any more about how it's uh, how 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 to continue with peace studies, please feel free to reach out to me, and uh, we will um, make um, the information available through the um, uh, through our platform as well. And um, before we conclude, I really want to thank uh, Dr. Hallward a lot for giving us uh, her time today and her expertise. And um, uh, yeah, uh, like the students said, they really benefited from your talk. And I'm hoping that some of them will reach out to you or to me uh, for with further questions. And before we thank you for the uh, invitation, and I'm happy to talk with any of you who are interested in our programs. Just reach out, and I'm happy to talk more. I will make that information available to them. Thank you so much, uh, Udipada, for your initiative in organizing today's lecture. And thank you, uh, Dr. Hallward, again. And before we conclude, uh, just an announcement for the next lecture. Actually, uh, we are um, um, we will be celebrating our like in our our third annual day as, as a team, fifteen minute hikya. And on that occasion, so we have a guest speaker who is a very leading. Uh, worker who has been working in the field of you know i mean uh, conservation of birds so she is known as the hargilla lady and her name is uh, purnima devi Berman. and uh, i think many of you guys know about her and she will be our guest speaker uh, for our third annual day lecture and that is on february 25th uh, after two weeks and please join us and she will uh, discuss about her journey and what uh, led her to work for those uh, Hargila, that is uh, that is the Assamese word, I think, for that the bird, and which is, uh, so hope you will be able to join us all. So see you all again that time. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody.